All right, so uh, today's topic is about uh, writing and completing reports and proposals. So if you remember, uh, we spoke about planning different kind of writings. And now today we will talk about actually writing them and completing them. So when we talk about different kind of uh, reports and proposals, uh, it really depends what is the uh, report about, what would be the format and the length of the report and the order and structure of the report. For example, you can write uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, personal statements. You can write CVs or resumes. You can write uh, letters to external organizations. You can also write uh, research proposals. You can write uh, thesis dissertations. So today we will see uh, some samples of these reports and also we will differentiate between the format and different you know, kind of uh, factors that vary from these uh, uh, reports to reports. And uh, when we talk about format, of course, uh, one particular element is the formality of the report. That are you sending this report to somebody who is on a formal position or you're sending it to some friend or colleague. So when you send uh, messages and reports to your colleagues and friends, they tend to be semi-formal or informal. But when you try to send them to certain institutions, regulatory authorities, your professors, scholars, they tend to be very scholarly. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, there are certain uh, documents that have pre-printed form, that it is a form and you only have to fill the form. So it becomes very easy for you. But there are some considerations that you have to keep in mind. Whenever you fill a form, please always use block letters. Block letters means capital alphabets because sometimes while you're write, writing small alphabets uh, your writing is not that clear to the reader and it becomes very uh, you know jiggled up and it can be difficult for the reader to comprehend what is written so when we fill up a pre-printed form we have to be careful that we try to read and understand the questions properly and then answer accordingly uh, so because in future you would be applying for different kind of vacancies and when you apply for a vacancy you usually have to fill a form and it is very important to give accurate information because later on uh, they can cancel out your uh, application just because a couple of uh, words were not properly written on the application form and then you can write letters um, if you remember we spoke about letters and uh, let's uh, actually see an example of a letter today so we can actually uh, talk about what letters are so here is an example of a letter and as i told you previously the letter includes a letterhead where you find the company's name or the name of the person who is sending the letter and then with the name you find the address of the sender so this is usually called the letterhead. It is at the very top of the letter. Then you have the date upon which the letter is being sent. And sometimes when this is an official correspondence between institutions and companies and uh, you know individuals, uh, they tend to write uh, reference numbers as well. And sometimes they are called diary numbers. So how to write diary numbers, you can look at the internet and uh, there will be examples of that. But then you have inside address, the address of the receiver of that letter, that to whom you are actually referring this letter to. All right, then you have salutation where you write down, uh, dear, if you know the name of the person. So it can be written as dear Mark because you know the letter is being sent to Mark, but sometimes you are not sure to whom you're actually sending the letter. So dear sir or madam, or you can write both like, if uh, any of these people would receive, it won't be you know, awkward to see the letter. And after salutation, you have the body of the letter in which you actually explain and you write short paragraphs to show your uh, you know, understanding and the way you want to communicate your message. So we have three different kinds of uh, uh, writings that we have generally. Uh, one is called, uh, you know, you have good news messages. Good news messages are the messages that uh, we try to announce things that are uh, appreciable or excitement 
uh, that we want to share with other people. So there are good news messages. Then we have bad news messages where you are actually communicating something uh, not good, you know, something not favorable. So if we talk about good news messages, for example, if um, you get admission into a university, the letter which is given to you by the university, which is the acceptance letter is usually a good news message. And bad news message can be the decline in the admission. As well as if you want to communicate uh, to somebody about the loss of something or some person, that can be a bad news message. And then you have uh, the letters uh, called persuasive letters that include persuasive messages. Now, persuasive messages are where you try to persuade somebody. You try to uh, ask them for help, or maybe there is a complaint uh, which you want to register and you want a solution for a problem. So in those cases, you have to write persuasive writing. So depending upon uh, the nature of the message, for example, if it is a good news, you will use the direct approach that you will start with the good news and then you will jump up to the information which is complementary. And if it is a bad news, you usually use the buffer strategy or the sandwich strategy. The buffer strategy says that uh, initially you actually uh, try to establish trust with the party to whom you're writing. Uh, you just show your compassion and show them that how uh, you're feeling sad about what happened. And then you um, explore the situation by writing about the actual facts of the information. And uh, at the end, you also show empathy that you understand that this is a very challenging situation and uh, always show some kind of uh, help that you can provide if not, then you can tell them where they can acquire the help. Uh, but when we talk about persuasive messages, they are also very direct because you show a problem that you're facing and then you talk about a different kind of solutions that you're anticipating or maybe you request for uh, some solutions that they can provide you. So you write these information in short paragraphs in the letter, then you have uh, your uh, you know complimentary clause where you say respectfully or sincerely and then you have your name and signature. So this is the format of letter. And of course, this is a full block letter. That means everything starts at the very left. Sometimes you find uh, letters where the date is usually on the right. And that is also okay. And also when the date is on the right, you see that the last section, which, which has the complimentary close and name and signature, they are also usually on the right. And then you have modified block where uh, sometimes the signature and the name are on the left side, but uh, uh, complementary clothes and date are on the right side. So you can have a mix of them. But uh, the modern uh, state of the art, uh, you know, format for letters is that you use full block, that everything is on the left. Okay, use everything on the left of uh, uh, the indent. All right, so this was about a letter. Now, what about a memorandum? Let me show you a, an example of the memorandum. Uh, memorandums are usually are starting with the, the name memorandum. Usually memorandum or memo for short is written at the very top and then uh, the company uh, in which this memorandum is being issued. Uh, letters are used for external communication when you're uh, communicating outside of the organization. But when we talk about uh, memorandums, they're used for internal communication. And they, they can also be used for external communication, but they show that the informa information was produced within the organization, and then later on it was shared with the external entities. Now you have uh, the name and the address of the company, then uh, the most important parts. First, to whom uh, the memo is addressed. So you will find sometimes a lot of people in the two section because uh, different departments and different colleagues of you uh, would be addressed usually when a memorandum is issued. And who issued the memorandum? From is the place where the memorandum is being issued and then the date and the diary number of the memorandum because a lot of memorandums are being issued in every organization. So it is uh, very you know favorable to keep record of each and every one. Then you have the subject line where actually you see that what kind of uh, message is being communicated, what is the main idea in this memorandum. So usually when we talk about uh, organizations, uh, Ramzan came or maybe the COVID-19 
that caused the change in the timing of the working in a particular office. So what happens? Uh, what has the uh, what happens? The office actually changes the timing through informing the employees through a memorandum, and that memorandum is usually addressed to all employees, and they say that uh, all employees. Uh, should read this memorandum and this is from the human resource human resource department and then again the subject line could be the change in timing of uh, working hours due to COVID-19 or maybe due to Ramzan then you have uh, brief paragraphs where they actually write the subject of the memorandum because this is this is a memorandum about a health healthcare priority policy so the policy is a very long policy. So you see a lot of pages. And I have purposefully selected this memorandum because I wanted to show you that most of the memorandums do not extend beyond one, one page. But what happens when the memorandum extends beyond one page? Then you have to give a header on every page of the memorandum, as you can see here. And you also have to show the page number in the header. So this is very important. So when somebody receive, receives the memorandum, they can know how many pages are there and which page number they are reading. And at the end of the memorandum, uh, you usually CC people. And you must remember from our discussion about the emails that who are CC, CC mean carbon copy, that the personnel that would be kept getting a copy of this information. So here you see that there are people their names and designations are mentioned. Usually what happens in smaller organizations and especially in hospitals, in public sector hospitals, only designations are mentioned. Why? Because people come and go and designations change, change, change. So you have to have designate, excuse me, designations instead of the names of people. All right, so this was the format of a memorandum. I hope you now understand the letter and memorandum uh, format. If there is any question, you can always pop up uh, with the question and I will try to answer it. So any questions about letter and memo? No, sir. Okay, so uh, then you have mem um, manuscripts and uh, manuscripts belong to reports uh, that are short reports and long reports. Maybe I should also show you, show you a couple of, you know, uh, the manuscripts, for example, there is one manuscript of a CV and we have worked on resume and you have prepared a resume, but let me show you a CV and CV is a lot more extensive than a resume. So this is a person and I have given a funny name to this guy, Mukaddar Kasikandar, but uh, this may be uh, belonging to Mr. Mukaddar or Mr. Skandar, anyone. Uh, then you have the objective uh, at, after the uh, title of the CV. In title, you can see uh, the curriculum vitae is the he heading and then the name of the person, then the address and contact information is given. And that needs to be at the very top. And I have seen that people sometimes write a couple of phone numbers, uh, maybe three or four, because they have multiple SIM cards, but that is not very professional. Give only one phone number. Uh, it should be your cell number that is portable and always with you and always give the number that is active, which people can reach to you. And do not give funny email IDs. Prepare an email ID with your own name and always write that email ID because that shows a little bit of professional touch. And if you have an organizational email ID, for example, uh, if you join an organization and they produce an email ID for you, do not put that email ID on the CV. The reason for that is that if you leave that organization, they will block your email ID and you won't see any future correspondence on that email. So use one which can be used for long term. And then uh, the person has object, uh, stated the objective that what they are trying to pursue in their life and objective statement always start with two, to pursue a challenging teaching and research career relevant to pharmaceutical sciences and biotechnology. Okay, so Objective needs to be short, but specific that in which field you're trying to do what. And then you actually introduce the major skills that you have acquired. Now resume is crafted on a particular date and it is usually sent to employer for a particular vacancy. But CV is very dynamic. You keep updating your CV. 
you keep adding information to your CV. As soon as you acquire new skill, you learn something new, you attend a new seminar, you have a new diploma, you update your CV. So skill section comes first because that shows what skill set you have and how that can benefit the people to whom you're sending your CV. And then if you, you don't have much employment history, maybe it is a good time to start with education first and then move to employment. But if you have worked for five to 10 years, then employment history is something that you produce before the education that you want to show that what you have done. So uh, make it extensive, read, um, write each and everything about the job that you have done, every project you have worked on, every file that you have worked on, every uh, you know research work that you have done. Uh, if you have helped some people in their projects, also if you have participated into certain seminars and trainings and write each and everything in detail because CV is a detailed document. So here's a manuscript of CV that I'm sharing with you. Then um, also uh, try to see the formatting of things because if you're listing down things in, in the CV, make sure they are proper lists. And if there is uh, some important information, make sure that you actually highlight that uh, with bold or italic format. So it is, you know, it springs out of your document and people can easily locate the information. I will uh, share these templates with you so you can further explore that what are different parts of them. Okay, so let's see for, uh, further that uh, when we talk about manuscripts, we also have, uh, we also have professional personal statements. So personal statement is something which you usually write to somebody when you are applying for a scholarship or grant and personal statement shows the uh, kind of uh, pursuit that you have, the kind of interest you have in the research field. And I, I, have, an, I have a sample for you. So let me share the sample with you so you can see it and then we can talk about it. So uh, here's a sample personal statement for, for a pharmacy student. I will share the template with you, but uh, I wanted to show you that there are no headings. It is like an essay and the length is only one page. So tomorrow when uh, you will be graduating from a Basin University, you must be thinking about applying to different international universities. And one of the most important documents they require from you is your personal statement. Sometimes they call it the statement of purpose. So they ask you that uh, to write a brief personal statement, which is around 250 words to 500 words. They usually ask you to write a research proposal and send a personal statement with that research proposal. So that per personal statement needs to be in first person. I have always had a great interest in science and mathematics because of the impact that both of these have on our daily lives. I have become fascinated. So this starts with I. Yes, please, if you have any other questions. Any quick question? Should I answer? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Kisi ko koi question hai to pooch sakta hai. Okay, so I will carry on. Uh, when we write research proposals or maybe research reports and uh, thesis dissertations, they are not in first person. They are always in third person. We do not use I, we, are, uh, because first person is usually for personal statements, for personal letters. So when we talk about personal statement, the format will modify because we will use the first person and we will talk about ourselves, our ambitions, our personal you know, uh, pursuits and how they relate to the degree that we are applying for. And then I also want to share one final thing with you, which is a sample thesis, which I will be uploading on LMS. So you guys can go through this also, that uh, when we talk about thesis, uh, first of all, let me know, can you see this document, which I'm showing you right now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. 
So this is the title page of a master thesis. And then you have uh, the approval page. After the approval page, there is the table of content. And table of content has uh, all the headings and subheadings. And you can see the difference between headings and subheadings. The headings are bold and subheadings are not bold. And they have a little bit smaller font. Also, you can see the headings are chapter headings. They have, they have whole numbers with them. One uh, as the literature review, but 1.1 in decimal places, you have the subheading, the first subheading under the first chapter. So 1.1 is the first heading and under the first chapter, 1.2 is the second heading under the uh, first chapter. So you have to be careful about headings and subheadings when you are formatting a long report or maybe your thesis dissertation. Then you have a summary. Sometimes this is called the executive summary. And sometimes you put an abstract instead of a summary because this is uh, written in, in some European country. So you can see that every page has also a translated page. Then you have acknowledgements. So in acknowledgements, you acknowledge the efforts done by other people. You thank other people. For example, you thank your supervisor. You thank your head of department. You thank the colleagues you, who helped you and everybody who helped you. And sometimes you thank to your parents also. And uh, then you can also have a dedication, but then you have a list of uh, uh, abbreviations, all the abbreviations that you have used in the document. And with those abbreviations, then you have a list of uh, 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 terms and uh, you know, list of uh, pictures and uh, tables. Then the introduction starts, which is the first uh, chapter. Then you have uh, objectives of the research, the literature review, and make sure when you put tables in any document, you format them properly. You have the header for the table. And remember that the header of every table comes at the top of the table. And then you have captions. If you have a figure, let me show you. If you have a figure in the document, you have a caption for the figure. And the caption comes at the bottom of the figure. So when you put a figure in the document, the caption has to be there. And the caption comes at the bottom of the figure. But when we talk about tables, tables do not have captions. Table have headings. And the, these headings come at the top of the tables. And make sure you properly format your tables in any document. And uh, towards the end of the document, you have a reference list. So you can see here is the reference list where you provide the complete bibliography that in this document, you have used information from different sources and you actually show uh, the sources here because this is a chronological uh, series. You can see one to three written here. So in the document, you will find uh, these numbers mentioned in the text. So you can see that uh, on page number 14, 20 is mentioned. So this 20 can be used. What this 20 is for, I can go to the references and I can see the reference number 20. And that will show me that this information was actually inspired from source number 20. Now thus, uh, this does not, uh, does not mean that you actually copy paste the information. This shows that you actually read the information from this source and then paraphrased it into your own words. You cannot copy paste in any kind of document. Copy pasting is plagiarism and plagiarism is illegal. Uh, in international universities, you get penalty like, uh, you know, they uh, fail you in the course or maybe throw, throw you out of the uh, university. And totally you have penalties and we have percentages like for your final thesis, you might have 15 to 20% of the plagiarism, which is acceptable. Anything beyond that would not be acceptable and your document will be rejected. So all of this uh, discussion was about uh, the formatting of uh, different kinds of reports. And uh, this is very important when we talk about the uh, manuscripts and uh, different letters and memos. Okay, so uh, when we talk about uh, choosing an approach to write a particular document. There can be two approaches. One is direct approach. Number two, indirect approach. Uh, these two depend upon the audience that you have. For example, if the audience is very friendly, very receptive, and you know the message that you're trying to communicate is a good news message, 
then you use the direct approach. You start with the message and then you detail the information. You write about the points within the uh, initial idea. But when you see that this is a bad news and uh, the audience can be skeptical, they can be very critical and they can be angry or hostile. And you see a very strong reaction anticipated from the uh, reader. Then you have to use the indirect approach where you actually build a scenario a context for the reader that what this is about and why you are writing and later on then uh, you start writing about the main idea of the main content of the information so uh, when you structure the information of the reports it is very important to see what sequence you should use since you guys are students and uh, later on you will be working on your research projects and you will be writing uh, you know university reports uh, most of the times you will be given templates so always follow those templates. They will show you that which fonts to use and what should be the size of the font, what should be the size of the heading, how to format the document. Uh, always follow those kind of directions. Okay. And uh, so there are solicited and unsolicited uh, reports. Solicited uh, use the direct approach as I told you and unsolicited, they use the indirect approach. All right. So it is important to format all the tables and bar graphs and pie charts, line graphs and flow charts or any illustrations that you include in the document. Do format them, provide a caption at the bottom if this is not a table, but if it is a table, always provide the heading for the table. And at the beginning of the document, you have to provide the list of the tables and uh, uh, list of figures. So it can they can be easily located within the document. So some of the, uh, you know, very basic kind of information is given about these uh, bar graphs, pie charts, and uh, how to use them. They need to be basic. They need to show the pertinent information and they need to be formatted in the proper way. Uh, later on, you can read out that why uh, this information is, you know, important for them. Uh, one important thing is that if you use uh, flow charts or organizational charts in the documents that you have, Make sure they are properly formatted. Uh, the boxes and lines are connected for, uh, properly and they are approved by somebody who is, you know, in the organization showing that this is really what actually exists in our organization. Do not use the false, in, false information or uh, something which is not true. So depending upon um, the kind of uh, graphics that you require in your projects, you use computer softwares and uh, there are uh, a lot of applications are there. For example, Microsoft Excel is there, PowerPoint is there, and Microsoft Visio is there that you can use and produce these graphics, right? Uh, so um, when you write the reports, make sure first you create an outline and then you finalize the outline and start writing in each section. And sometimes you have to go back to different sections to revise, revise the information. So revision is always a basic part of the writing process and the text uh, need to be uh, formatted in the proper format. Then you have to look at the degree of formality. That is it a formal report and, or an informal report? Most probably your assignments, your research projects and all the information that you provide to your head of department and your teachers, they are formal reports. So use uh, you know, the highest level of formality in them. Do not try to be casual or colloquial about uh, your writing and then take care of the time perspective always make a timeline of the long documents and divide the work into different timings and try to follow the schedule and submit them before time so you have enough time to get the review get the feedback and work on the feedback do not delay it so always have navigational clues which means that show different kind of list of tables and figures so people can easily navigate through the document of course, the accuracy, the completion, the balance, it should be there. We have studied about seven C's and those seven C's need to be there in every document that you write. What are the successful proposals? If you talk about research proposals or research reports, they will demonstrate your knowledge. They will demonstrate the level of uh, expertise that you have. They will provide pertinent and concrete examples about the information that you're trying to show. And you will show that your research is up to date, that you have all the data which is available these days. And then you prove that your proposal is workable. This is workable and you have a proper methodology 
terms. You will later on study uh, a course on research methodology or maybe epidemiology, which will help you how to develop different methodologies about research proposals and adopt a you attitude that you tell them that how this will benefit you and the community. So don't show that this is a very selfish pursuit and this is just for your own sake, right? And package your proposal attractively that make attractive headings in the proposal, right? So then there are uh, multiple sections that I will actually uh, ask you to read by yourself because they change from uh, different document to document, but mainly what are the uh, mainly common parts that there is a cover, a title page, and then there is the internal cover. On the external cover, you only have the title of the work, but in the internal cover, you have the approval from the different bodies. Then you have letter of authorization, where you write down that every work which is included here is your work, and you take full authority that you have not plagiarized this work from anywhere else. So you sign the letter of authorization, and then there's a letter of transmitter, which you get signed from uh, the authority, uh, like your supervisor, that you're trying to publish this report. Then you have table of contents. Then you have list of illustrations, figures, and tables. Then you have list of appendices, executive summary, and then the main body of the document and the reference list. And uh, then you close with the appendices and different kind of index. Appendices and index, they include the information which is not the part of the main body of the document, but still that is important to understand what is written in the report. So you put that at the end in the appendices, but always have the title of the appendix, appendix A, appendix B, appendix C. So appendices can be easily accessible. All right. So these are the parts of different reports. I hope you got the idea that how we actually write reports and complete them. If there is a question, please ask so I can actually answer that question. Yes, guys. Any question? Kahin aftari to nahi sab log tiyar karne shur kar di. No sir. Okay, who will summarize? Karega? Let me let me ask names. I will name you. I will take your name. Tell me. Afaq, tell me. What have we studied today? Afaq or Bilal Shahzad Yes Bilal, you can tell us a little bit, summarize it, what did you study? Salih, we have read the business letter and in that business letter, first of all, डेट मतलब पहले अपनी कंपनी का नाम अब उसके बाद एड्रेस वगैरह उसके बाद डेट अब अपना नाम वगैरह और फिर उसके बाद जिसको लेटर लिख रहे हैं उसका अगर नाम पता है तो उसका नाम लिख लेंगे या फिर डियर सर और मैडम लिख लेंगे तो फिर हारून खान आप बताएं थ्री फाइव नाइन टू हारून खान जी यस सर इसके अलावा आपने क्या पढ़ा सर लेटर ही पढ़ा लेटर के साथ लेटर ही पढ़ा है जी और व्हाट अबाउट रिपोर्ट्स रिपोर्ट्स के फॉर्मेट में क्या कुछ पढ़ा हमने ऑल राइट थ्री फाइव फोर जीरो प्रिया आप बताएं रिपोर्ट के फॉर्मेट में हमने क्या कुछ पढ़ा है सो आई थिंक आई विल आई विल पुट हियर मार्क्स ऑफ क्लास पार्टिसिपेशन फॉर दोस हुवर पार्टिसिपेटेड एंड हु डिड नॉट पार्टिसिपेट एंड मे बी नेक्स्ट वीक आई विल अनाउंस a viva quiz that i will ask you guys about you know the information which is recorded in the lectures all right so i think uh, uh, since the time of uh, zoom meeting is near to finish 
Uh, last announcement, I will share the chapters of uh, the book so you can read them and I will share the activities that where we are going to have the quiz from and from where we will have the assignment. Thank you very much. See you later, inshallah. Thank Take care, Allah. Okay. Jiji, ask me. Sir, I joined a little late the meeting, so sir, you have not given any assignment at the start. I will share the recording with you, so from the start it has recorded, so then you will see it easily. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.